are, which is exactly where we're supposed to be. So, so it's time. So for those of you joining us, so glad you're here uh, for Super Saturday Recovery Summit. If this is your first Super Saturday Recovery Summit, I'm getting so much better at saying that. That's kind of a mouthful, and I've had mm -hmm. a lot of practice. So, so Dr. Rob Weiss, who does the Sex, Love, and Addiction group on Friday nights and has been doing so for about four years, um, had the thought that we know lots of professionals who normally speak just to the other professionals in the community, and how great would it be if they were able to talk to those of us in the recovery community. And so he approached um, uh, RT and Kenny of In the Rooms, and they graciously agreed and have really stepped into this uh, as well. So we've been hosting these since April, and I've had the privilege of participating in this capacity and always learn more and enjoy interacting with everyone. So um, I will be quiet. I will two more housekeeping things. Please do not request to share. If you have questions, if you would just IM them to me, Dr. Danziger will be presenting for about 40 minutes. You can follow his slides, which are on the link in the blue bar above. Um, and uh, uh, then I am your questions to me. And when he's done with the presentation, we'll, we'll go through those. So I'm going to toggle off and turn it over to you. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you for having me. Jamie, thank you for recommending me. Uh, thanks to Rob and everyone else who has made this series happen. It's fantastic. Um, I do spend a lot of time talking to other clinicians and I don't spend, well, I, I, I go to, I, I'm, I'm a meeting a day kind of guy. So I do spend a lot of time talking to my fellows, but not in this, I don't get to, you know, share on this topic for 40 minutes. So i um, really glad to be here. Glad to have the opportunity, glad for the format. And uh, just in terms of the background, you know, I, I put a little background slide there. Um, it doesn't include, you know, so I'm sober 31 years now, or I've been in AA for 31 years. And, and that's just a quick and easy way of saying that's, that's how I landed here. Um, in as much as my path has been a long and winding road. Uh, and it's obviously, I guess I'm in some long term recovery now. And that mindfulness and anger management have played a part, uh, a major part in my own personal recovery. And then it's just happened to become, you know, I know, I know not everyone becomes a professional uh, around these kinds of issues, but um, that's where I landed. So I'm really glad to be here and just be amongst some folks and, and talk about stuff that might be helpful. So, you know, some of the background is I'm a therapist here in Cal. I'm in LA. I'm in California. I moved here in 2002 from New York. I'm, so I'm from New York originally. I was a, pretty much a New Yorker. Um, I have been a Buddhist practitioner for over 30 years. Uh, and how that happened was uh, about four months sober. Uh, my best friend at the time, who's still my best friend today, that's what happens in recovery, right? Um, you know, we're, we're across the country from each other and we still talk every day. And I'm godfather to his son and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, he, he was like, hey, you want to go on an AA retreat? I had like four months sober, I think. And I said, that sounds stupid and boring. And he said, it's at a Zen Buddhist monastery. I was like, that sounds exotic, weird. Let's do it. And so I went and I got my first sitting lesson and I've been sitting in that way for over 30 years now. So it's like a, my primary spiritual practice within my 12-step uh, practice. And so I actually lived at that monastery where I got that lesson for a year. Uh, I did it so you don't have to. It was uh, four and a half hours a day of meditation on a regular day. Uh, and then on retreat days, like 10 to 12 hours. And I loved it. Um, you know, it's not for everybody, that kind of life. And I actually was going to stay there. And my teacher was like, yeah, you should go back and help people in the world. You, you shouldn't be sitting on a mountain for another four years. That would have been the drill. Um, so, so that's where the mindfulness comes from. And so I've been practicing it for 30 years and teaching it in one form or another for, for 25. Um, my first uh, work in as a sober person was I went to uh, something that still exists. I love sharing about it. The Employment Program for Recovering Alcoholics. It's run by New York State and the Smithers Foundation. It's still there. And it was basically vocational rehabilitation for, you know, looking at addiction and alcoholism as a disability. And so we were went through a six week program. Sometimes it would be longer. Uh, and so I, I had up until that time been a punk rock drummer and I wasn't really finding myself able to continue that particular career. And so I uh, became a high school English teacher. 
and I loved it. And then there were uh, racially motivated incidents in the neighborhood where I was teaching. Uh, those of you of a certain age, Crown Heights riots of uh, 1992 or three. And I ended up diving into that. And, and I bring all this up because, again, this all obviously fed uh, why I'm sitting here today having this conversation with everyone is that, you know, there's a lot of anger, there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of trauma. Um, and I, my grandfather had been a civil rights person and he had taught me a lot about the, that, those issues. And I kind of dove into the middle of the pack in dealing with the healing. And over the next three years was involved in rewriting curriculum for New York City public schools and all this kind of stuff that, you know, you just show up and stuff happens. Um, and then I left the school system and I had a 15 year career as a diversity and inclusion and social justice trainer. Um, and which included uh, germane to this subject, uh, teaching a juvenile diversion course for young people who had been convicted of hate crimes in New York City for five years. Um, and so instead of going to juvenile, they went and saw me for 10 weeks and some other co-facilitators. So I learned a lot about anger and conflict resolution. I got trained in conflict resolution at Columbia University. Uh, through the school system, all kinds of wonderful things, wonderful opportunities that I'm uh, blessed to have had. And then when I moved here, I eventually became a therapist and I became an EMDR therapist very quickly uh, because of who I met first. And then I was working in addiction treatment. And then I read a book or saw a book called Trauma in the 12 Steps. And I called Jamie and I said, or I emailed her and I said, we must know each other now. And we've been friends and collaborators ever since. So, um, so there's that. And so the relationship between mindfulness and anger, anger management and trauma and PTSD and addiction, all these things are one of the same, it's all in the same bucket uh, for me. And so uh, I get to sort of uh, be with that both personally and professionally. And, and that's how I kind of walk around the earth. So I've written a few books and uh, co-written one with Jamie, or actually now three in a sense. Um, I uh, collaborated with her on the step workbook and the um, med daily meditation reader for Trauma in the 12 Steps. And we're currently finishing up another book together. So, um, and then one of my books is Mindfulness for Anger Management. So that's what kind of brings me uh, to the topic today. And the last thing I'll tell you about myself that's I, I think is important is that I'm I'm really uh, concerned with uh, let's see what the best practices are now and for the future, uh, you know, informed by the past. So I'm actually pretty heavily involved in tech, a couple of technology companies, which whatever if you knew me, you know, I'm I'm 58 year old guy who still thinks about how he kept the VCR blinking on 12 o'clock all the time. But anyway. It just turns out that, uh, you know, a lot of wonderful things that we're doing uh, to assist in our recovery. And uh, I'm also in, to that uh, to that point and to all the other points, really, I'm in a master's in healthcare innovation program at the University of Pennsylvania right now in my spare time. Um, and it's a three year program. And I am amongst a cohort of about 100 doctors, nurses, academics, clinicians. And we're all trying to move through COVID and move through the oncoming tsunami of PTSD and complex PTSD together. So uh, a lot to do in these days, right? So, um, so again, I'm really glad to be here with you all. And uh, I'm gonna uh, talk to you a little bit about anger as it fits into AA, uh, because it, it, you know, sometimes I jokingly call AA an anger management program. I mean, right there at the center of it is, you know, resentment is the number one offender. And so, you know, take it from there and some of the uh, language about anger in the book or the literature, some of it I like, some of it I don't, talk a little bit about that. Um, and then looking at anger from a mindfulness-based perspective, uh, you know, what is it about anger uh, that is so troubling? Because there's a lot to, you know, that's troubling about it. But as Tammy was saying offline before, you know, it's indicative of sometimes it's just as simple as a strategy to not do sadness, right? Uh, to, to move over to the side of anger. And, and Tammy brought up also the, the main thing, power. 
um, you know, that a great deal of the power that I've found in my life has come from understanding my anger to not be uh, evil in and of itself, that it's my response. And so since mindfulness is really so much about how do I respond to things, it's, it's not about the pain of life, but my response to the pain of life, right? So something happens and then I respond, that's where the, the problem is, not with the anger itself, right? That's just a natural human emotion. So we'll talk about that. Uh, and then um, how we can uh, implement mindfulness to help in sort of sustaining our long-term recovery. You know, because that's my goal. You know, I, I, I find, you know, there's many people who are able to sustain recovery for this or that amount of time. And that's great, especially if they're able to uh, not go down the shame spiral. Uh, if there's a relapse or a lapse or whatever one defines for themselves as that. And so, and then be able to say, oh, now I can keep going, I can keep going, right? That it's not a, a, a death sentence of some kind or a, a, dec a vast declaration of one's inability to do life. So, um, so how can I uh, stay on the path, you know, regardless of um, uh, level of abstinence, uh, if abstinence is the goal? So, um, so anyway, uh, anger uh, is a big relapse trigger. One of the things that I found just from my own experience sitting in rooms but also then working in treatment and running anger management groups is that uh, one of the things we would talk about in those anger management groups with, with people in the group would be, you know, let's go back as many steps as we need to go to find the anger moment that drove the relapse. And we'd always find it, right? It would either be an old resentment or a flash point of anger, or there was almost always I wanted to say always, but I'll, I'll say almost always because there must have been a couple of outliers, but almost always maybe it would take two or three or four steps to get there, but we would find how anger uh, would do that. And, you know, the research kind of bears that out. Uh, and I, you know, my own personal uh, case study research on myself, you know, my whole thing was I was raised, you know, uh, God bless my dad and rest, may he rest in peace. He, um, he had anger, a lot of it, and expressed a lot of it towards me. Never got hit, but there was, you know, a lot of, a lot of rage, uh, and and I learned uh, that I, it wasn't okay for me to meet that rage with rage, or that my response was to go inward, right, to, uh, to not express it. So for me, uh, alcohol, which was my primary, uh, alcohol became my gateway to be able to express it. You know, like and once I turned, I actually I started using uh, drinking when I was 12 and I would say I started to qualify at about 14. So by the time I was 16, uh, I was very good at school. I left for college at 16 uh, and I was already playing in punk rock bands. So I was at college and at CBGB. So I got it. The, the possibility of me not turning out with at least some substance abuse problem was pretty low. Um, but uh, anyway. Uh, point being that it's how I was, you know, for some people, it's a way of kind of dialing it down and getting it to go away. And then for me, it was a way of like opening the door, right? Like that the anger would be, hello, I'm angry. So, um, so anger and relapse are, are very tied together uh, in that way. And then when we look at the core literature of a big book, etc., cetera, um, you know, anger is pointed out as uh, a high risk emotion, right? Uh, anger is best left to those who are better qualified to deal with that kind of language, which was, as far as I'm, I'm a big Bill Wilson fan, by the way, and Dr. Bob too. Um, but the the languaging around anger was incomplete in as much as there's a lot left over for people to beat up on themselves and to think that that suppressing anger is a good strategy. I'm not saying that the language isn't there to kind of push someone out of that idea. But because of the nature of the psychological and spiritual language of the time, that was, as, I, as far as I'm concerned, I've had so many sponsees in particular, clients too, who just think anger is bad. I can't do anger or else I'm going to drink. Like that's the, the formula. So, so that is one of the things that when I, when I reached out to Jamie, that was one of the things that she had kind of really sorted out pretty well. Uh, you know, seeing the connection between trauma and the 12 steps and the connection between trauma and anger is is like this, right? I mean, uh, 
the trauma response is built out of the fight or flight response, right? Anger is fight. Uh, flight is often, you know, just anger in reverse, right? So, um, so uh, the thing is too, the thing that I do like about uh, the AA uh, approach uh, to anger was this idea that resentment is the number one offender. Resentment being anger coagulated, right? Anger just turned into this immovable object, this giant blob of, you know, I hate blank, right? And I look at, you know, my own family, I know a lot of people have these stories. My own family, there are family members who didn't talk to each other for 40 years and they have no idea why they didn't talk to each other for 40 years, right? And I remember when I got sober, I kind of had, I was like looking at the playing field of who doesn't talk to who. And I got very confused once I was sober. I was like, why isn't, why isn't they, why aren't they talking to them? I don't get it, you know? And, and then uh, finding through the step work that I did, uh, the freedom from that type of, you know, resentment, that type of, you know, just really getting stuck um, in it. So um, looking at 12 step recovery, but also looking at mindfulness, uh, mindfulness is a really strong uh, technology to help people to um, start to find a way to manage their anger because mindfulness is about noticing body states, noticing mind states, noticing emotional states, noticing things as opposed to acting, right? So, you know, many different people have said it in many different ways. Viktor Frankl called it the pause, right? That, the, that moment where we're able to make different decisions about things is located in the pause. Bill Wilson spoke of a pause, right? And so mindfulness, it, it, it has a lot of layers to it. And the mindfulness that I speak of uh, derives from the, the Buddhist psychology version in as much as it's not just about techniques, you know, sitting this way in your Lululemons uh, at sunset by the beach. It's also about um, uh, living an ethical life, which is something that really ties it very well into the 12 steps. I don't have a slide on this today, so I'll, I'll, I'll insert this here. Um, there is a, there was an article in the fix, the fix.com uh, a few years ago, Bill W and the Buddha. And it was looking at some of the um, uh, correlates, you know, between the two. And the, in their research, her name is Regina. She found a pamphlet from an Ac one of the Akron groups, the early Akron groups, edited by Dr. Bob, right? And those of you who are familiar with AA history of the two, you know, Bill Wilson was like, let's have a seance, let's take acid, let's find all the different ways to be spiritual. Dr. Bob essentially mostly kind of found his Christian faith and, and practiced it, right? And so in this pamphlet, it said, we have looked at the spiritual traditions of the millennia, and we have found that the one that resembles our 12 steps the most is the eight part program of the Buddha. 1940s Ohio. <laughs> Not expected by me when I saw that. And I've been riding that wave for a long time since I saw that uh, pamphlet. In as much as uh, he noticed, uh, Bob, Dr. Bob and whoever else was involved with that pamphlet, they noticed that the ethical component, the action component, the living component, that mindfulness feeds ethical living. Ethical living also feeds mindfulness. When I'm not lying, cheating, and stealing, I don't have to spend all my mind time trying to figure out how I'm going to get out of the mind, you know, the cheating and stealing that I just did. Right. So, uh, so Buddha's, you know, as Buddha's, uh, psychology was really a psychology, of course, spiritual leader. And, uh, there's lots of conversation to be had some other time, but, uh, the point being that he modeled his eight part program after the medical model of the time. Right. Uh, in, in addition to it being having ethics, he used like a diagnostic, like the diagnosis is that life has difficulty and suffering and that it, the cause of it is basically the action of our amygdala, the craving and the clinging and the aversion, the fight or flight, running the show. And that if we are able to overcome that or have a different way of looking at that and then working with that, that that would be the solution. And then the prescription was the eight part program or the eightfold path which has three ethical factors. How do I speak? How do I act? And how do I live or as a worker? And then all the rest are about wisdom, like building my wisdom, setting intention, and then um, and maintaining mindfulness. 
and concentration. So anyway, the, the whole point being that um, uh, since the three poisons that Buddha identified were greed, anger, and delusion, right? So anger is one of the poisons that's going to be directly dealt with by mindfulness. So, um, so that's where I've seen the, um, uh, how they um, work together. So uh, before I go into the rest of the material around mindfulness, I wanted to invite you actually to, to try out uh, the one exercise that I use with every uh, group that I work with, and you can start playing around with it if you want. And it's very simple, it wasn't rocket science, but it's, it's around the idea of using a zero to 10 scale to rate my anger at any given moment. And the reason why is because what I discovered for myself is that number one, uh, anger is an energy. I am quoting uh, the great punk rock philosopher, John Lydon, formerly Johnny Rotten, when he said that. And that also um, that anger uh, is something that um, uh, if I place mindful attention on it, it is no longer controlling me, right? And that mindlessness of anger is the problem, not the anger itself. So if I start to intentionally start to notice my anger on, more regularly, so like, for instance, when I would work in treatment centers, I would have someone in the beginning of their treatments do it like on the half hour, right? Every half hour, like just notice zero to 10, you, you, you don't have to write anything, you don't have to do anything, but just like find the number. And the way I describe a scale is this, right? Zero to 10. Zero and 10 are pretty much the same for most people. Zero is someone comes up to you and they're like, they yell at you, they tell you you suck. They maybe even hock a loogie at you. Well, actually today that would be, don't do that ever, right? But they do all these terrible things and, and your response is, you know, namaste. And it's not like namaste in the back of your mind, you're like Chucky, right? It's real, it's for real right so it's very rare zero is very rare and it's something we can put on the horizon but it's not it may not be even the goal because it's so rare right it's so easy for that to be spiritual bypassing it's so easy for that to just be like yeah it's all good no it isn't <laughs> right there's still something going on then a 10 is the equivalent of you hate this talk so much you take your laptop you throw it against the wall it smashes into pieces you run out onto the street in front of your house or apartment and you punch the first Prius or other hybrid or electric vehicle you see in the face. Not the person driving it, but the car, right? Because a 10, there's a possibility that, you, that the hippocampus can shut down like at the peak of fight or flight, people go into a blackout, right? So those are very poor decisions. Laptops broken, people are scared, you have a broken hand you know, all of those things. So 10 is thankfully pretty rare. Then 0.1 to 9.9 .9 are very personal for, for everyone, right? So everyone's got their own anger palette. Everyone's got their own resting anger rate. People wake up at like a one, some people wake up at four. <laughs> they're like, as soon as they wake up, they're like, ah, right? So we discover our resting anger rate this way. We also find out where's the danger zone for us. Danger zone is different for everybody, right? So for you, a seven might, you know, there might be something called a seven that's like, oh, I better like get away from people right now. Um, or I better do whatever my, you know, big things that I do in order to like downgrade things, right? So, so um, be that as it may, um, go ahead and literally take a 20 seconds and just check in with yourself. And you might have other emotions going on too, but see if you can find your level of anger. Keep in mind all the synonyms for anger, you know, disgusted, um, a little miffed, <laughs> frustrated, right? All of those words, not just about rage. Rage is over there on that one end of the scale. So just touch into yourself for, for a moment and notice zero to 10, where's your anger? And what we'll do is we'll, we'll recheck on that when I'm done. Um, you know, it's only going to be about 20 more minutes. So you might, you know, there might not be a big change. And that's fine too. Noticing that there wasn't a big change, right? Or noticing that a four became a 4.5. 
Like once we start to get into those more nuances, um, then I'm mindful of anger. Like I'm not just kind of being tossed about by it. I have an insightful relationship with it. And that's a game changer. Just doing this, I've seen it uh, be a game changer for people. Um, so the rest of the book I wrote was not, you know, fluff after that. But, you know, this, this goes a long way. It's, it's the one thing that I've been doing since the beginning. I started doing anger management groups and treatment uh, probably about uh, almost 20 years ago. And so I've been using this scale all the time in, in treatment. So the thing that we need to know about anger, which is why we want to become mindful of it and not just let it toss us around for one re reason or another, is we want to know what it really is, which is an ally. It's a boundary setter. It's uh, something that has a, a ton of action potential. Uh, I'll, I'll share with you about my, my therapist, Simon, that I had in New York. So, and it's a great name to have for a therapist. Simon says, and Simon used to say, you know, anger is actually the life force. It is how we set boundaries. It's how we identify unmet needs, right? And remember, you know, as I'm speaking, you might be thinking, but that's crazy, right? You know, like, you know, so then it's okay to like take a crowbar to some hood of someone's car who uh, cut you off at the gas station? Um, of course not, right? Is that super unskillful? But that same energy, that same anger, that same energy, you know, could have been channeled differently, right? Like if I was channeling my anger appropriately, someone cutting me off at the gas station is not worthy of a crowbar, right? Uh, what can I do with that energy instead? I can save it <laughs> or or it's not triggered at that moment. Like my triggers could, would, should be more uh, justifiable to get into the dangerous territory of justifiable anger, right? Um, you know, where what, what are my battles? What are the battles that I pick? The other thing to remember is that it's completely, utterly natural. Like a lot of people come to the table hating their anger you know, talking to their anger, talking back to their anger in a way that uh, shames, shames myself for having such an emotion. And no matter how much we wish it would just disappear, it's not going to disappear. It's just not. Remember, we're not talking about rage. We're talking about the whole spectrum, right? I go back to the Buddhist psychology. You know, uh, Buddha talked about um, uh, suffering, right? Everyone, most people now know, it's like mainstream, right? That his primary teaching was that life is suffering, which turns a lot of people off from Buddhism like immediately um, because it sounds like a downer. Um, but the fact is the word dukkha uh, in the Sanskrit and the Pali language that, uh, he, that was spoken then has two translations. One is suffering. The other is unsatisfactoriness, right? So, so it's covering the whole spectrum of what it's like to be a human being alive in a body, right? Like I wake up in the morning, I have an 11 year old. She's now 11. Like she, as soon as she turned 11, she started talking different. It was like weird. Like she went from like, I love school to like, I don't want to go to school today, right? I, I could turn that if I'm not in a good space with anger, that could be World War III inside or outside. I could, yeah, go on it. you know, like, what's my reaction? What's my response? And so it's natural and it's not, it's not going to disappear. It's actually part of our survival mechanism. It's helping us survive, fight or flight. That's about surviving, right, at the bottom line. So the insight that I'm able to develop through mindfulness ranges from, ooh, that's, that's not worth getting crazy over, all the way to, um, I have deep insight into this situation and I can take that anger energy and realize what I need to do to set a boundary or to put something into action. I think back, you know, when I was in Crown Heights teaching at that high school and all the kids that I was working with, they were angry. They were angry and I was angry. And so we all put our heads together. What can we do with this anger? And, you know, them more than me put together a peer training program, you know, to help people, you know, help their peers understand these issues that is now, you know, however many years, you know, almost 30 years old. Like they created that program. What did they use to create it? A lot of 
a lot of it was created out of, out of their anger, right? And so that energy uh, needs to be expressed somehow. Um, it doesn't disappear. We don't surgically remove it. Uh, in a sense, the best word I can use for it is it transforms. Um, you know, I'm not talking a lot about trauma therapy today, but um, or EMDR or trauma therapy in general. But you know that that is kind of what's happening: is all these emotions, all these survival mechanisms, all these memories that weren't processed properly become transformed. They're not surgically removed, right? Uh, some of the sort of um, uh, survival tactics that we develop over time, they do fall away. But the, you know, the memory is still there. I can think back, wow, that really, that did suck. But it's not happening now, right? That's the key there. And so it's the same with anger. Anger is a lot of like built up, you know, unresolved angers over time, <laughs> placing themselves onto a current situation. So it doesn't happen in a vacuum there's usually some kind of, or there kind of has to be an internal or an external trigger to make it happen, right? So being that there has to be a trigger, then it, then we get to look at, okay, so then obviously then I am responsible for the response, right? I may not be able to control the trigger, especially when it's external, but um, I uh, have control over the response. So, so yes, when it's when anger is mismanaged or unmanaged, that's it's destructive, as the kids like to say today, destructive AF, right? But um, uh, when um, and that is because when people are triggered, they lose their ability to reason. The fight or flight system kicks in, and it is designed to tell the cognitive part of the brain to shut up. I don't need you right now. You know, it just skips that whole thing. And so we're being driven um, by the uh, part of the brain, parts of the brain, you know, the limbic system, and then the body, which basically does what the limbic system and the reptilian brain tell it to do when it feels like there's a threat. And so there you have it, anger mismanaged. So addictive not just addictive behaviors but addictive thoughts you know like getting into a rumination can help make anger go away right i can kind of like soothe myself out of the anger in a way that isn't really doing anything to the anger except kind of smashing it down for later um or it can help the person to like i used to do when i was uh, younger you know help me to express it and to to get into it and as uh tammy and uh i well tammy was talking about offline before you know sadness is one of the most common emotions uh that triggers or drives or has a person go to anger instead but it's not the only one that's that's something that i hear a lot in anger management circles not as much anymore it was kind of like the old story that it was just like sadness e anger equals unresolved sadness but it's much more complex than that uh, anger, I, I don't look at anger as a secondary emotion. It is a primary emotion. It's one of the emotions often triggered or coaxed along by things like sadness and also by anxiety. Um, a lot of, I find my experience has been a lot of people with addictions and a lot of people, you know, especially in early recovery, when the body and the brain are just trying to like figure out what the heck is going on, um, that the anxiety can turn to anger really quickly. And so from, from my money, it, it then requires a whole lot of um, self-compassion uh, around that fact for people in early recovery. And those of us in later recovery, uh, and those of us in early recovery who might have tapped into how to soothe that a little bit more, have a, I think, have a, uh, what's the call, word I'm looking for, responsibility to you know, sort of take care of our fellows as they go through that and not let them turn on themselves for being angry. Um, so how do we use mindfulness to, um, to do this? Uh, first of all, realizing that it's anger itself is not the problem. Um, and the, it's more our opinion about anger uh, combined with our express, how we express it, that becomes the problem. So uh, the key is to help ourselves meet anger in a different way. Um, so, uh, why do we want to do this? Because we don't want to lose these, you know, a lot of people laugh when I say it, the benefits of anger, right? Um, you know, it tells us what, where we have unmet needs. It gives us assertiveness, 
right? Like, you know, we have to watch between assertive and aggressive, but that energy, right, helps with being assertive. Um, it helps us to set boundaries. It, it actually assists in making healthier connections with people because denial of anger results in things coming out sideways. If I am in, uh, if I know I'm angry, I can have a direct conversation with somebody. It actually fosters creativity. I once took a, a, a comedy writing workshop with Robert McKee, a screenwriter, and he came out and he said, literally his opening of the workshop was comedy the angry art, <laughs> right? So, you know, like it, emotions, emotions foster creativity, including anger. Um, it actually can elicit compassion um, and it can help people to motivate, you know, into action. So here's what you need to know, cause you know, I'm gonna do five, you know, less than 10 minutes, maybe a couple more than five, that's all right. Um, what we need is we just need enough mindfulness to become mindful of my anger. Like that's the purpose of the zero to 10 piece. That if I can get one step ahead of my anger, if I can have just that much insight into my anger of, oh, I am angry, look at that. It's a win because we can, we can leverage that. You know, if we can continue to uh, hang on to that is not the right term, but you know, if we're able to just kind of walk in that spirit you know, um, uh, on a more consistent basis, um, that's, um, that's going to do the job. Um, and the, the key here is that, uh, you know, anger itself and other strong emotions like it uh, lead to a, 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 a lack of awareness, a whack of awareness is what I was gonna say, a lack of awareness, right? And so uh, mindfulness, the word uh, mindfulness is a translation of a Sanskrit word which actually means not just awareness, but coming back to awareness. The implication uh, being that um, we're always leaving awareness, right? And we're always given the option of coming back to awareness. Um, so um, first we need to become uh, uh, aware of uh, the body, right? Because the body is where all the anger uh, action manifests right like to just understand that there is um a great deal of um the suffering comes from uh the fact that you know there's chemical changes that go on that are beyond our insight mind ability to control or to even acknowledge at times um that basically tell the body to continue you know Make some cortisol, make some adrenaline. Let's get ready. It's time to go, right? So the more that we're able to practice simple body-based, whether they're seated or in movement, ways of getting in touch with these body sensations that go with our anger. And there, there, there are some that are more generalized, meaning, you know, like the increased heart rate, right? Stomach gets upset. Sometimes we can get ringing in the ears because the blood's rushing right there, right? So the more that we can sit and, oh, my ears are ringing, I must be, I must be angry, <laughs> right? Or, and, and let's, let's see if we can watch that pass, right? So getting more in tune um, with uh, the body piece. And then we can move on from there. I mean, it's not necessarily like one, two, three, but like the next step or the next so the category is, you know, thoughts, right? How can we diffuse our, um, our uh, rampant and sometimes destructive angry thoughts? And the answer is kind of the same, is tuning into them mindfully, um, you know, practicing simple practices like uh, just choosing a, uh, a um, object of meditation, like uh, a body sensation or my breath, right? The in and out of my breath. And then anytime I notice a thought, doesn't matter whether it's a pleasant, unpleasant, or a neutral thought, doesn't matter if it's an angry thought. As soon as I notice that thought has taken me away from this breath thing, just gently bringing myself back, right? And so what's that, what that is doing is continually bringing me back to the body. Oh, and there I go. And I start to tune into what this might look like to come back to my body anytime the thoughts start to get into that dangerous territory. 
Um, I'm just looking to see what of my material I want to make sure I get to before I uh, sign off and start doing some questions. Um, so through what I just described, you start to get the ability to integrate the body and mind. They seem less uh, distinct from each other, which is a big pro I have found, you know, over the years, just in my own recovery and my fellows, and then with the people that I work with as a clinician, that there's this like, you know, I've, I've exited the body, right? I I've, I've, don't have an awareness of it because it's too darn uncomfortable. And oftentimes I use substances to disconnect my mind too. So I'm just disconnected. And so when I get sober, things start to connect up again and it's very uncomfortable. And so if I start with the body and work with the mind, you know, body, mind, body, mind, and emotions kind of play right in the middle of those, then eventually I'll become, come to a more integrative uh, state of uh, being. Um, so um, I'm actually going to, uh, you, you have some extra PowerPoint slides. I hope that they're, they're helpful. I'm going to start to wrap up by uh, just sort of uh, looking at um, how do I transform anger uh, into the heart practices of Buddhist psychology and Buddhist practice. And the reason I go there is because here's something that I've found over the years that many times people, actually there's, there's a couple of slogans in, in AA that are helpful here. Uh, fake it till you make it. Although, you know, I have mixed feelings about that, but it's more like just do it. Even if it doesn't, you don't feel it yet. Meaning that uh, working with the qualities of loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, taking joy in the joy of others, and equanimity, sort of the balance under any and all situations, that I can, from day one of recovery, begin to cultivate those. Like, because, you know, people see them as the results of years of mindfulness practice. But the fact is, much like people tell you, they told me, like when I had like three days, you know, I had a guy in my, who became my sponsor eventually, Randy from the Bronx. He was like, you see that guy over there who has one day? Go help him, right? So similar to that, that at three days of recovery, I had something to offer somebody. Same here, I have these things to offer myself. I can, I can intentionally cultivate these mindfulness practices of loving kindness, bringing mindfulness to loving kindness. I can bring mindfulness to my compassion for others and for myself. I can bring mindfulness to the idea that I might not hate you because your life is good, that I really uh, get joy out of that, and that I might be able to cultivate some of this balance even before I feel like super balanced. And so what does this have to do with anger management? Is that loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, equanimity, all antidotes to, to anger expressed in that more rageful way. It's it, the, the, the loving kindness and compassion are actually made up of some of that angry energy. If that, I mean, it, it sounds upside down, uh, but that's been my experience, you know? Um, so I'm gonna wrap up there. Um, in, in the PowerPoint, uh, the, the next slides after this uh, give you basically a rundown of the skills that I go over in my book. So, you know, you can save 15 bucks on that and, and, oh, well, look, wait a second. That was the end of the, <laughs> and that's the end of the slideshow. So there you go. Who knew that it was actually this, 44 minutes. This, this has all been so fascinating. I've written a whole bunch of notes, even with the PowerPoints, I'm still taking more notes. So I, I just love it. So, so we have a bunch of questions for those of you that are trying to pop into the request to share. We, did, we aren't doing that with the Super Saturday Recovery Summits, but um, I am me, um, uh, the questions, but we've got a bunch. So so in Dr. Rob Weiss's Sex Addiction 101 workbook, um, this this one came in when you were talking about um, anger as the trigger. If you take a few steps back, you, you know, it's always that anger. So this person identifies that um, in Dr. Rob's book, he said, 
uh, he says relapses are classified as internal and external, which you talked about. Um, but he mentioned, Dr. Rob mentioned, internal triggers include anger, boredom, loneliness, sadness, and other emotions. Does every relapse anger behind it, or could relapses happen due to other internal triggers? Your oh, thoughts on that? 100 percent. I, my, my, the premise I was talking of was not that anger is the, is the soul, but you, would, you will always find it somewhere in the picture. That's been my experience. Um, boredom is like number one. I mean, bore, to me, boredom is kind of anger. Boredom is one of, is, it's like, man, life's so boring. <laughs> it sucks. I well, and loneliness do. too. I was thinking. I was like, you know, angry at being lonely. Angry at being like. I bet that there, like, when you're talking about taking the gauge of your anger, I bet there's, you know, the hum of anger with any of those, you know, type of triggers. It's it's. I, I would say that too. And that you know, lo I mean, loneliness is a is a, another pandemic. Um, in addition to it being such a huge part of our dilemma, you know, as recovering people, and so so yeah, so. I was more about that sometimes, many times, it's like, it's like I got angry and I used. And then it's sort of, I, I go back. It was like I was bored for a while. And then before I was bored, I was kind of angry at the fact that, you know, recovery wasn't showing me some joy the way I got it back in the day, that kind of thing. So absolutely, there's all kinds of other uh, relapse triggers, like including, you know, didn't talk about this a lot today, but you know, trauma, right? Unresolved trauma, um, which may or may not have an anger component to it. It's just, uh, you know, the memory of and and or the different emotions or sensations that go with it, you know, drive me to relapse. So, yeah, thanks for the question. It's so, it's it's a complex web. Y yes, Th this is so often i think the case too how do i begin to forgive someone who has treated me very badly in an mm. intimate relationship we are both sober people part of the anger at myself for allowing myself to love this person i have separated completely from them but and you mentioned you know some self anger and things too but you know i mean how do you even where do you start with something like that uh so first of all thanks for the question been there done that wrote the sequel um, so I also uh, look at it because I, I heard the question being about the forgiveness part. And just uh, for starters with that, um, forgiveness is a process, not an event. Um, many wonderful teachers have said that. Jack Cornfield's one, Sharon Salzberg's another, uh, where uh, a lot of times we think of the forgiveness being, I'm finally there. And then we go, I forgive you, right? Um, and 12 step teaches us otherwise too, you know, when you really, you know, you know, come down to it, like when we do nine steps with people, um, we're asking for forgiveness. Um, and we don't, there's no requirement that they, they say yes, that was great, thanks. And there's no requirement that they say yes, and let's have a relationship again. And that, that, and that goes both ways. And so um, once I'm aware of that, then I can uh, be kind to myself and look at almost like I was doing the zero to 10 with the anger, look at the zero to 10 with wh where I'm at with forgiveness. I don't know if the scale is so helpful there, but you know, like where am I in my process of forgiveness? Um, and a lot of times I find it really, really, really helpful. This is kind of a, a thing with me in recovery is because uh, recovery often uses the language for better, for worse, of what's my part in it, I, I'm much more uh, likely to say to someone else or to myself, how can I forgive myself, you know, for, you know, whatever aspect of this relationship that you're talking about or anything else that I'm dealing with? Um, how can I point the compassion and the forgiveness towards myself? Then, then my part in it will become more uh, real more uh, authentic um, rather than it being just sort of like this guilty journey into lack of self-forgiveness and asking for forgiveness and all of this. Um, so uh, I'm trying to get my head around because I do, I, I kind of identify pretty strongly with this question um, and I'm finding that it's moment to moment. Like one moment I'm like full on forgiveness. Next moment I'm like, 
How am I ever going to forgive? And then everything in between. So just acknowledging the process orientation of it. And I think, you know, for me, all, all of the most painful things I have been through um, uh, that, you know, that I could carry anger at myself have been the most important life lessons I've learned, you know, mm. and at the end of the day, you know, as painful as they were, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade a thing. I was in bad relationships. What I learned has served, I have an amazing husband now. I mean, like mm. I learned enough to not keep picking the wrong person, you know? So, so it was one of those things, um, uh, that there's lessons and gifts even in the pain for me anyway okay so yeah. next question I was raised in a religious home where anger was shamed denied and forbidden how do I heal the shame so I can freely admit and express my anger also as a woman I've been shamed for expressing anger how do I help people in my life who deny they are angry and therefore won't be able to express it and move through it when I try to tell them they seem angry and get angry with me. So lots of old history about not being able to acknowledge anger. And, you know, um, thank you for the gender specific question, um, because that has been a problem, I think. You know, when, uh, if I think about my history as a clinician working with people on issues of anger, uh, you know, and, and I would have what I call, let's say, mixed groups. And I, I don't mean gender mix, but um, rather anger style mix. And oftentimes, so, you know, so yeah, so I'd have the rageaholics along with the person who says, I never get angry, right? Or I don't even know what anger is. And a lot of, and a lot of that would be women who were told it's not okay or shamed out of it or, you know, that uh, in the world that we've been living in for the last number of millennia where uh, gender roles are very specified and who can be angry and who can't be amongst other roles. Um, is there. And so, so the answer is, uh, in a sense, is getting whatever kind of uh, therapy, uh, step work with a, with a trusted other around, you know, like, like kind of really leaning into the anger aspect of the, um, of what the steps have to offer. Um, and then also, you know, here we are doing the mindfulness thing. So, you know, finding uh, mindfulness uh, practices and teachers that auth auth authenticate your experience, right? That, you know, that say, okay, you know, me too, and here's a space where we can both talk that through and sit through that together and grow in our insight into everything that I talked about today, that anger is natural, it's an energy, it is useful, it sets boundaries, it allows me, to, it motivates me into action that's gonna help myself and others, right? Uh, so finding communities and practitioners or sponsors or fellows or friends, you know, anyone who uh, values your mental health, your emotional health, your ability to be fully yourself. And it's, it's sort of the same answer with, you know, uh, the religious side, you know, um, you know, so many different spiritual traditions have different ideas about the role of anger, whether it's good, bad, or, or ugly, and then various spiritual communities, regardless of which, uh, you know, what religion they are, uh, can have, you know, off-putting ideas about, you know, what's, you know, what's uh, okay and what's not okay. So uh, similar but different, you know, finding the people who understand, you know, maybe fellows who've been through the same, that same kind of experience, um, uh, like that. Okay, we have a bunch more questions. We're gonna do our best to get through them. I am wondering, how do you stop in the moment, the path from anxiety turning to anger? Mm. Great question. Um, you know, and mindfulness of anxiety, I find is a lot harder than uh, mindfulness of anger. Um, in, in as much as anxiety is so body-based, it can just so feel like literally I have no control over this, right? So um, finding, I, I'm, I'm gonna recommend the zero to 10 deal um, because 
uh, that's what I use. Uh, a lot of times I would ask that question in a group and so, and more than one person might say, I can't find my anger, but I can tell you that I'm anxious. I can tell you what level I'm anxious to. Then go ahead and identify your anxiety number and your anger number and start tracking those and see how they relate to each other. And, um, and then find, you know, over, you, know, you could maybe over just the course of a week kind of find what the tipping point is where it goes from anxiety to anger or kind of right. what you need to manage in the anxiety in order to not go to the anger. And, uh, and the reason why I'm saying it in this way is that it's not cookie cutter. It's going to be different for everybody. And then finding what it is that helps you to deal with your anxiety. For some people, it's like, you know, intensive exercise. For others, it's like four or five meetings a day. For other, you know, whatever it is that works for you to temper that, and then that will allow you to have a better sort of window into where the um, where the uh, crossover point is um, for you. And then the other, the, the last thing I'll say, and I've been, you know, we had this in my own little family here. It's me, my wife, my daughter, and we had to put up a sign, you know, during the shutdown. We had to put up a sign that's in big letters that said quick to forgive, you know, like in the moment, because all of us, you know, each of us, we were taking turns, you know, like, you you know, just it was rough. It, it's rough again. Right. And so there'd be like these moments um, where the anxiety would turn to anger. Um, so in that regard, being quick to forgive yourself. When the anxiety turns to anger. Um, because that is a big part of getting it to not both not continue and to not take you down a shame spiral like i'm a terrible person i was angry so the next question how do you gauge how to respond to passive aggressive communication by a close relative or in yourself if it's recognized mm. So one of the concepts that I teach often is uh, how do we set boundaries with the boundary list? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the way we do that is over and over and over again. Um, so, um, you know, when, I, when I'm faced with passive aggressive communication from a loved one, then obviously that's an ingrained pattern. Um, and so, you know, it, it doesn't usually doesn't come out of nowhere. It's kind of part of a strategy. Um, and so uh, what I need to do is I look at myself not to see where I did something wrong, but rather to see what I may not be doing as skillfully as I could in being direct back to the passive aggressive person, right, to call it out, essentially. So, um, you know, some situations are safer than others. You know, if it's like an unsafe situation, I'm not going to call it out, you know, directly without having allies. But if, if it's safe enough, um, the strategy really is, it's like, how do I just say, um, I heard you say, you know, using I statements, all those things that we learn and kind of taking care of ourselves and not uh, escalating something, right? So a lot of that comes with vesting the relationship. I care about you. You know, this relationship is important to me. And then only uh, talking about observable behaviors or observable statements, things that you know, you just heard, you know, and then uh saying what it is that i want you know like what do i need um in this uh, engagement and then here's the last part and this is by the way these are the same steps for informal intervention the last step is make sure you take care of yourself get help for yourself like talk to a trusted other who isn't that person to even if it went well right to just like do a monday morning quarterback uh, thing where you're just sort of uh continuing your process of understanding I'm continuing my process of understanding myself better in relationship. So that's a few thoughts on that. That's a big one. It is a big one. Well, here's another big one. Cause so I, how, um, I often cannot catch the anger and react destructively right away. Any suggestions on how to catch it sooner? So the, the, I know I've been sort of, uh, it's almost like I'm uh, selling a zero to 10 program, but that, that's my first answer is, is that, <clears throat> you know, I, I don't know the whole story, right? But it sounds like you're resting, the resting anger rate might be very high, 
and that the the distance between you know like resting anger rate is five and the flash point is six and then i'm at 10. another thing that so so starting to learn a little bit more about that and seeing if we can bring the resting anger rate down so it takes further to get here and then also maybe this even dial, you know, uh, dials up a bit right like so that you have a greater distress tolerance like that which triggers you uh becomes a, a wider berth right like you get a trigger but if it's within this realm you're not gonna go into your rage sort of thing also know that that's a really common thing i've had so many clients come to me and they're like i have two numbers i tell them about the numbers they're like i got two zero and ten right like they so they have no awareness right because the thing is is the way you're describing it and it, it absolutely it's true in the moment right like it's like you're just kind of minding your own business and then bam and then we're off right but in fact there's any and all past material and when i say past it could be like 10 minutes ago or 10 years ago that's feeding the setting of that intention that is often really outside the level of conscious real consciousness right it's like the fight or flight system just takes over cognitive shuts down and it's and it's and it's on so anything you can do to to develop build and develop uh, mindfulness of you know kind of what your internal life is like so that you get to have more uh, agency over your external responses in the future so if we can hang in just a, we've got a couple more quick questions okay thank you so um uh, I have a question. Does he also recommend other types of therapies like emotional freedom techniques, EFT, um, and or primal scream therapy or anything else? Oh, well, yeah. And, I, and there's a follow-up. How do you handle shame and guilt associated, which express in, in anger? So. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thanks for both of those. So I, I have a little bit of a skewed picture here. I, I'm an EMDR therapist. I... I recommend I EMDR that. therapy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm an EMDR therapist, EMDR trainer. I've trained hundreds of clinicians. Uh, I, I work as senior faculty in Jamie's Institute for Creative Mindfulness. Um, and my experience has been that, you know, anger is so uh, wrapped up in the experience of trauma and trauma recovery. And that one of the one of the first rounds of symptom relief that most of my clients seem to find is relief from the anger, sort of just the the feeling of an inability to manage their anger, um, which comes from, you know, in the beginning of EMDR therapy, we don't just start uh, waving our finger in your face. If, you, if that's you know, if you're familiar with the therapy, uh, we do a lot of work up front, uh, including a lot of mindfulness based work up front. And in that mindfulness based work, we start to help people to notice, you know, what's happening. You know, so I can't, I've never uh, done EFT with anyone, nor have I been an EFT client. So I, I can't speak to a lot of the other therapies. I know that they, a lot of them work along many of the same premises as EMDR therapy. Um, so, you know, finding what, what's a good fit for you. Yeah. Um, but I highly recommend EMDR as a, as a primary. And then with the shame and the guilt, that's a, such a wonderful question because that's, one of the things that um, we teach in uh, the, the Institute for Creative Mindfulness curriculum is reminding people to acknowledge the role of shame and guilt in addiction, in, you know, trauma. And that, you know, 99.9% .9 of people who are dealing with those issues, there's a shame or guilt component. And that's very easily triggered. So one of the ways that I uh, look at it uh, well, I'll give two ways. One is that shame is kind of like this wraparound, like there's all the issues I have, and then the shame has built like this covering uh, around it. It's like this uh, amorphous thing that is part of the whole. Um, and so uh, when I go into therapy, when I find 12-step groups or other groups where I'm mirrored and I'm acknowledged and I'm cared about and cared for, that starts to reduce the shame and then any of the therapeutic or mindfulness sort of work that i do also helps to reduce that shame um i can't remember what the second thing was so i'll, I'll leave it there it's all good and then the one final question and i'm not i'm not as clear on what this question is so we'll see if we can figure it out all right where does i need a reason to be angry come from um if i'm hearing it correctly 
it's actually, uh, in one sense, it's a true statement, meaning that the intern there needs to be an internal or an external trigger, right? So, so if I'm if I'm understanding the question correctly, right, that makes sense. Yeah. So if I'm understanding, so that's the that that's a truism about anger itself, which then sort of says to me that mindfulness is the key to addressing that. Um, because it's not about the trigger, right? Triggers are going to come and they're going to, I'm going to get angry, right? I'm going to have that response. Then what's my response to the emotion and the situation, right? And so um, I think that it comes from a little bit of truth, I guess, you know, um, that uh, it doesn't happen. It was part of my presentation. It doesn't happen in a vacuum necessarily. And if we don't, if we, if it's not evident right in the moment, if we trace it back, you know, we can usually find it somewhere, the trigger. So true. So true. It was lots of good professional work helped me. So this has been fascinating. I'm so glad to have had this opportunity with you. And thanks for all of you for hanging in with us. Great questions. Fantastic presentation. Uh, Dr. Danziger's information is on his slide. So do drop him a note if you have questions questions um, and reach out by his books <laughs> so, um, and uh, we'll be back in less than an hour in about 54 minutes for the next presentation so thank you again bye everybody thanks everyone thank you Tammy <laughs>